So I'd like you to turn in your Bible to James chapter 2. We'll study verses 21 through 26. Here's the uh, heads up that I'd like to give to you as we study this text. Uh, I could best relay the, the warning by way of a story. When I was in uh, my first year in Bible college, I would leave school every day after being in four or five classes, uh, somewhat mildly depressed and wondering if I had uh, really found my calling or if I was doing something uh, that I didn't need to do. Uh, after about uh, two or three months of this uh, somewhat sad feeling that I was having after classes, one of my wonderful professors, Dr. Joe Faulkner, um, pulled me aside, asked me if something was wrong. And I said, well, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be here. Every time I leave these classes, I'm just uh, broken. You know, I, I feel this small. And he said, well, Young man, you're not discerning. You're not discerning the work of the Word and the work of the Spirit in your life. I said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, when you sit under the Word of God, and part of the ministry of the Spirit is to humble you, to, to show you that grace is... Uh, is of God and God alone and that nothing of your flesh will be able to boast in any of his purposes. So you're being humbled by the word of God. That had a tremendous blessing on my soul early on in ministry to understand the ministry of the word. Today's lesson, if you study it properly with a proper heart, you might leave this study today feeling small. Uh, probably a little wrestling going on in your life. That wrestling will only be because of the flesh and the spirit. Go ahead and submit to the work of the spirit. And you'll find that Christ will be exalted in his word. James chapter 2, we'll begin our reading at verse 21. This is part 2 of our study on faith and testing. Faith and testing. James chapter 2, we'll begin at verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the faith, or of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Father, I pray now in Jesus' name that you would grant us um, the mind of a Berean, that we would study the Word of God with a, a discerning heart. We thank you for your Word that tells us that if we are willing to do your will, we shall know of the teaching. We thank you for the revelation that every believer has the Holy Spirit. We have an anointing, and you will teach us by your Spirit as we submit to your word. We ask now, 
In your precious name, Lord, do your work deep in our souls that we might be more like Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. Let me begin our time with a, a discussion question. What I want to ask is what, what kind of works, what kind of works vindicate true salvation? I'm gonna need a, a dark marker um, I seem to have light ones here, so if someone can grab me a dark marker, that would help. What kind of works? Justify or vindicate salvation. Do you understand the question? Yes. The work of believing. The work of believing. Thank you, Brother Steve. Appreciate it. The work of believing. Can I play a little devil's advocate with you here? as you all answer. The demons also believe and tremble. What works, what kind of works vindicate salvation? Continuing to play the devil's advocate just a little bit. There is a repentance that leads to death. There is a worldly sorrow. Works done by faith. John 6, or I'm sorry, John 8, says in verse, if you look at it with me quickly, in John chapter 8, in verse 31, so Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. You read the rest of the context. Later on, he calls them, verse 42, if God were your father, you would love me. And then later on, he tells them, verse 44, you are of your father, the devil. Yes, ma'am. Glorify God, not man, that further his kingdom. Show. Loving what Christ loves. Loving what Christ loves. Chris? Uh, sharing the gospel. Sharing the gospel. Let me uh, come at it from another angle. There are different kinds of works that are described in the New Testament, and I want to give you the passages, and I'd like you to look at these passages and tell me what kind of works does the New Testament speak of. Okay, these are kinds of works in the New Testament. First passage, Galatians 2.16.
tell me, what kind of work does that verse speak of? Someone read uh, Galatians 2.16. Amen. According to those verses, um, or that verse, what kind of works is described? Works of the law, right? What are works of the law? The law of? Law of God, right? So it is works done in seeking to please God through the works of the law or the law of Moses. So it's when you seek to please God through the keeping of the Mosaic law, the works of the law. But that verse says, so by the works of the law shall no man be, right? All right, let's look at another verse or two. We're trying to describe those works uh, that the New Testament speaks of, different kinds of works. How about Galatians 5.19? It also describes another kind of work. So the first kind of work we're seeing here is the work of the law. This is where we seek to please God by obeying the laws of Moses. Someone read, Galatians 5.19. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are morality, impurity, sensuality. All right. Some versions use the words, the works of the flesh. So in that verse, what kind of work is described? Works of the what are the works of the flesh? Hmm? What are the works of the flesh? Yeah. Gives you a good long list of them there, right? And so you could probably say that those are deeds done by unsafe people that are in line with the, their own nature or their sinful nature, right? Their sinful nature. Deeds done by unsafe people that are in line with their sinful nature. All right, let's look at another passage. Colossians 1.21. Colossians 1.21. So we see the works of the law. We see the works of the flesh. We see another description of the kinds of works that appear in the New Testament. Colossians 1.21. Someone read that verse, please. The last phrase on that describes another kind of work that is done, and it's basically just called simply evil works or wicked works. Okay, one more. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. <coughs> Hebrews 9, 14. Here you go, brother. Oh, thank you. Okay. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. Someone read that verse, please. Okay. 
What kind of works are described there? Dead works. And we, we had this discussion last week where we talked a little bit about what a work of faith is. And as you can see, that the, we need to drill down into this, an understanding of what a fruitful good work is. Uh, there are lots of works that are described in the New Testament, but what kind of works vindicate true salvation? All right, let me put it another way. How do you know that you know that you know that you know you're saved? Okay. Sure. Yes. I say amen to that. But do you think that the demons or that we have a more orthodox belief in Christ than they do? We have a qualitatively superior belief than the demons. Well, That's where we're driving at. That's what James is driving at. But when we just say belief, you know, we have to clarify that. We have to qualify that. When we say works, we have to clarify that. We have to qualify that. And that's what James is doing for us here. And that's what I'm seeking to do with you this morning by way of this exercise. But let's go back to the question. How do you know that you know that you know you're saved? So if someone was to ask you, how do you know that you're saved? What would you say? Now, most people who know their Bibles well will say, well, pastor, I am saved because I have an inner witness that tells me that I'm saved. And they'll take you to Gal uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 16. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And so they would say, and perhaps you would say, I know I'm saved because the Spirit of God bears witness to my heart that I'm a Christian. And I say, good. That's how you know. But how do we know? That's how you know you're saved. The Spirit bears witness with your spirit. But how do we know you're saved? Others would say, well, I'm saved because the Bible tells me so. The Bible tells me that if I believe in Christ, I can know I'm saved. And you go directly to 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, which reads, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Are you familiar with the verse? And I say amen. The Bible does make it clear that we can know and be persuaded about our acceptance with God and the certainty of our salvation based upon the scripture. We can know. But how do you know that that salvation is yours?
one of the most frightening truths revealed in the Holy Scripture is that there is a belief in God, a belief in Christ, a belief in Scripture, a belief in the gospel that is non-saving. Let me give you some verses and you can read these verses later. John chapter 8, verses 31 through 44. You recall in that text, Jesus was speaking to those Jews who had believed in him, and yet those Jews, he said, they were of their father, the devil. They were not of Abraham's true faith. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. Brother Kinsale brought this verse up last week. Jesus made it very clear that there will be people on that day, that very final day, who will say, did we not do this and do this and do this and do this in your name? And he says, I never knew you. There is a belief in God. There is a belief in Christ. There is a belief in Scripture and even a belief in the gospel that is non-saving. Acts chapter 26 Verses 12 through 29. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. You all are familiar with that text, where, of course, the writer is saying to those Jews who had a certain amount of knowledge, and he says to them, let us fear while a promise remains of entering his rest that any one of you should seem to come short of it. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us just as they also, but the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 9 speaks of those who have been once enlightened, has, have tasted of the heavenly gift, have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, have tasted the good word of God and the power of the age to come, then have fallen away. It's impossible to renew them again to repentance. The good news is that later on he says to those believing Hebrews, but we are convinced of better things concerning you things that accompany salvation. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35 through 39, these are all passages that teach us that there is a belief in God, a belief in Christ, a belief in Scripture, a belief in the gospel that is non-saving. That is to say that there is a belief in all of these things that will not save you from hell. It is possible to even believe in the cross. It's possible to believe in the resurrection and never be delivered from sin. It's possible. This is what James would call dead faith. Dead faith. Now, in James chapter 2, he's already mentioned it three times in the span of the verses that we are studying together. If you notice in verse 17 of James 2, James 2 verse 17, even so faith, if it has no works, is dead. Verse 20, faith without works is dead or useless. Verse 26, for just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead dead. Verse 26 is a verse where James compares dead faith to a corpse without life. Dead faith can be all dressed up, all made up. It can look like life-like, and yet it has no internal principle of life at all. None. No breath, no action, no heartbeat, no pulse, no, no blood running through the veins. Dead faith is nothing more than a mannequin with, pain, with a painted smile. 
As a faithful pastor, James is concerned. He's concerned that all under his care would not be self-deceived about these matters. That's my desire as well. That's why I'm laboring with you in this way this morning. James has already sought to teach us in this letter that it's not enough to hear the word of God and not do it. It's not enough to profess faith and not practice it. According to James, faith without works is not just dead, it's false faith. It's counterfeit faith. It's not true. It's lifeless. It is non-saving. Charles Haddon Spurgeon put it this way. Faith and obedience are bound up in the same bundle. He that obeys God trusts God, and he who trusts God obeys God. End quote. Tozier agrees. The bony fighter, strong theologian from yesteryear put it this way. The Bible recognizes no faith that does not lead to obedience. Nor does it recognize any obedience that does not spring from faith. The two are opposite sides of the same coin. Let's look at how the Apostle Paul put it. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. A passage that we're familiar with, but we need to always link them together instead of seeing them how we often quote them, which is in an isolated way. <clears throat> Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For by, by grace you have been saved through, through faith and that, that not of yourselves. What is the that speaking of? That faith and that grace is not of yourselves. It is a, it's a gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one should boast or may boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God has prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. And so James, or Paul, puts it clearly, we are saved by grace through faith unto good works. They're all linked together. So having defined dead faith, which, according to James, is only intellectual, Dead faith is only intellectual. Having defined demonic faith as that which is intellectual and orthodox and emotional. Now he goes on to define for us dynamic faith, true faith, real faith. It is the only kind of faith that saves a sinner. The only kind. And James is going to define that for us now. As we look at this text, it's going to be important for us to continue to examine ourselves. And I have a tendency to go pretty fast when I teach. But I feel the necessity to slow down now. I've had a couple of weeks or longer to marinate in this passage, and I know that you haven't had as long, but I feel the need to slow down. <clears throat> what is dynamic faith? What is true, saving faith? Again, last week we defined these three kinds. There's dead faith, which a lot of people in the church have. There is demonic faith. 
And then there is dynamic faith. We said that dead faith is what? It's intellectual only, right? We said that demonic faith, demonic faith is what? So it's intellectual and emotional. Which means that just because a person cries or gets excited or seems to be moved, that doesn't mean they have real faith. The demons also believe and they do what? They sh shudder, they tremble, they have an emotional response. So, what is dynamic faith then? It's not only intellectual, it's not only emotional, but it's what? Volitional. It affects the will, and that will will always be a will that's been toward obedience to the will of God. You see, dynamic faith goes deeper than dead faith. It goes deeper than demonic faith. Dynamic faith transforms the person. It leads to change. It leads to a submissive, obedient lifestyle. Not, not perfect in obedience, but an obedient lifestyle. So James is going to set a contrast before us again. This time, this is not a contrast between false faith and true faith. This is a different contrast. In verses 21 through 26, James gives us two examples of true faith that works from the Old Testament. The first concerns the uh, patriarch, Abraham. The second concerns the prostitute, Rahab. Two people could not be more different. Abraham was a man. Rahab was, obviously, a woman. Ab Abraham was a Jew. Rahab was a Gentile. Abraham was a patriarch, the father of the Jews. Rahab was a prostitute, a woman of the night. Abraham was the progenitor of the people of God. Rahab was a descendant of the enemies of God. Abraham was the supreme example of faith. Rahab was the least likely example of faith. And yet now James places them side by side before us Two completely different people from opposite sides of the tracks, as it were. But they have one common denominator. One. They had a saving faith that proved itself in their actions, in their works. And the way it proved itself was that what they believed affected the way they behaved. Now you may want to make that note. What they both believed affected or determined how they behaved. In both cases, Abraham and Rahab, it was far from easy. Actually, their obedience was uncommon. In Abraham's case, he was asked to sacrifice his only son. In Rahab's case, she put her life on the line. Abraham is the example of saving faith from the best of men. But Rahab is the example of faith from the worst. So let's look at the shining example of Abraham and then let's drill down deeper into this issue of how 
true faith would show itself through works. The shining illustration of Abraham, verses 21 through 24. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Now, James begins this section with a question that is really meant to kind of draw us into the argument, but challenges us to think about it carefully. Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works? The way in which he phrases this opening question in the Greek really leads us to understand that James is trying to substantiate his argument by proof. Now, who was Abraham? Who was Abraham? Let's look at the text again. Was not Abraham our father? Let's uh, go back just for a moment. He was born Abram, son of Terah, you know, in Ur of the Chaldeans, or Ch Chald Chaldees, and in Mesopotamia, where, of course, they worshiped the moon god. You recall in Genesis 12, the glory of God appeared to Abram, and God called him to himself. His name was then changed to Abraham. Abraham was not the first believer, but he was appointed by God to be not only the father of the Jews racially, but an example or a model of all who would believe. Jew and Gentile. Romans 4.1 or 4.11 says that he is the father of all who believe. Romans 4.11. Galatians 3.7 says it, it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. Galatians 3.19 says if you belong to Christ then you are Abraham's what? Offspring, heirs, according to promise. Very clear, Galatians 3, 29. Abraham was not only the progenitor of the, the Jewish race, but he is a prototype, if you will, of genuine faith of those who truly believe, both Jew and Gentile. And when you see the name Abraham, remember this. In Abraham, he embodies what it means to believe. He embodies it. So what did he do? What kind of work did he do to justify or vindicate his salvation? The text says, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac? his son, on the altar. Now, is James saying that Abraham was saved because of his obedience? Is that what James is saying? Now, listen, the answer needs to be a lot quicker in a Bible-believing church about that matter. The evidence and the weight of evangelical teaching when it comes to understanding about what it means to be saved and to be right with God is clear. We are justified by faith. By faith. Let's look at several passages to drill down this truth. Romans chapter 3 verse 24. Romans chapter 3 verse 24. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the, the glory of God, not necessarily the law of God, but the glory of God. Verse 24, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 25, whom God displayed publicly as a 
atoning act, a propitiation in his blood through faith. Listen, we are justified by faith. Let your eyes skip down to verse 28. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Romans chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? Verse 2. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. You all see that? Romans 4, verse 2. If he was justified by works, and then he could have something to boast about, but not before God. Verse 5. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You can write down Galatians 2.16, Galatians 3.8, Galatians 3.24, In Titus 3, 7. The argument in chapter 4 from Romans is a pretty powerful argument. Paul is saying, listen, Abraham was not justified by works. He was not justified by circumcision. He was not justified by the law. He was justified by grace through faith. It was not about human effort. It was about divine power. So then what does James mean? Let's go back to James here. What does he mean? that Abraham was justified by works. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Abraham believed God and he was justified. When did that happen? That happened when he was called, right? That happened in Genesis chapter 15. And when he was called, he believed and was justified. This act of offering up his son on the altar did not happen until Genesis 22. So what is James saying? Well, let's go back and um, pierce some words a little bit. See that word justified? It's a very important word here. It means to declare righteous. It is used about 39 times in the New Testament, 14 of those times. When Paul uses it, it speaks of a legal declaration. It's a forensic act. It has this ideal of being acquitted before a court of law. And when you were acquitted in a court of law, then it would change your status your status from uh, an enemy combatant to a good citizen. This term was also used as a deposit or of something being credited into your account. And the Bible teaches that we're all bankrupt sinners. Uh, our sin debt against God is overdrawn. But God, by his grace, has done something. He has taken the divine righteousness of Christ and he has deposited that to our account. He has credited that to our spiritual account. And that happens when we repent and believe. And so now we have a standing before God that we could never earn. And that's what happened to Abraham. When he believed God, it was credited to his account as righteous. He was declared righteous righteous in the courts of heaven. It's also important to understand that that word justified, it is not a process. 
It is not a process. It's a declarative act. So God does not make a sinner righteous. See, that implies there's a process. He declares that they are righteous. Now, this justification is a once and for all act. It's a once and for all declaration. It never needs to be repeated. It never needs to be altered. It never needs to be, it will not be revoked. It will not be rescinded. But what it does is it changes a man's standing in the sight of God. And it moves us from being guilty to being accepted. It moves us from this state of condemnation to being accepted in the eyes of God. Now again, this declaration took place with Abraham according to Romans chapter 4 verse 3 when he believed God. Bam! It was done. For what does the scripture say? Romans 4 3, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteous. So the testing took place years, years, years later. And what James is seeking to teach us is this. That in Genesis 15, he was declared righteous, but in Genesis 22, he was shown to be righteous. He was shown to be righteous. Before who? Everyone else. God knew what he was, but now we all know that this man is a man that had faith in God, that he has faith in God, that he trusts God. This work was the visible manifestation to men that something had happened to him in the past. He had already been declared right by God, but you see, this action said to all of us, this is a true man of faith. And this is why he's in the Hall of Fame of Faith, right? I mean, as in, with all of the he heroes of the faith in Hebrews 11, right? I mean, Abel, what did he do? Well, he offered a better sacrifice. Uh, Noah, what did he do? By faith, he built an ark. By faith, Moses, what did he do? He chose to endure ill treatment with the people of God and to leave Egypt. By faith, when Abraham was tested, he offered up his son. And so all through Hebrews 11, it is proving to us over and over again, this is how faith acts. So what is James' point? His point is this, faith it's not merely words without actions. Genuine faith works. And they are inseparable. Faith and works are inseparable. They're two sides of one coin. And so we must ask ourselves this question. What actions in our lives show that we're really saved? And as you think of your actions, I want you to ask yourself this question. Are the actions that you're thinking of actions that can be done by an unbeliever? Say it again, brother. Okay, you're referring to Moses. Okay, of course, there's no argument there. But my question to you is, what, what, what works in your life, what works in my life, demonstrate that we're really saved? And are those works any, are, are they different than a moral unbeliever? You say, Pastor, I go to church regularly. I love church. 
Unbelievers come to church. You say, I'm kind. Robert brought that up last week. You know, being kind is a work. Unbelievers can be kind. Right? Cannot unbelievers be kind? Sure. What, what, what actions in your life prove that you are, are truly saved? And what actions um, are different than a moral unbeliever? Say it again. Love for the brothers. You said that would be different than uh, what an unbeliever would show. Okay? Any challenge to that? Gentiles do that. They love each other, right? And, and there are people who come to church and, they're, and they love other people in the church. Right? They love other people in the church, but then they're not born again, some people. Nicole? Sure, we want to glorify God with our works, right? So then my question to you is, I'm sorry, go ahead, finish your statement. Motives. But who can see your motives? God alone. So then you just say, and I'm just making an argument. You just say, well, you know what, you don't know my motives. I'm doing this before God, but I know I'm, I'm saved. So that's, should prove that you are a true believer because you say my motives are right. Jesse then Art. Okay. Okay, so there is a different attitude towards sin, is what you're saying? Mm -hmm. How does reformation play a part of that? Say, say a person used to drink and they don't like to drink anymore. Or they used to, they used to um, party, gamble, but they just, they don't like it anymore. They used to use foul language, but they don't do it anymore. How does that correlate with what you're saying? Because people can say, I don't like to do what I used to do. I, Yeah, you see it. You see it differently, right? Nicole, you, that's what you're saying. I, I'm, my motives are different, right? But what do, we, what do other people see? <laughs> I'm not trying to be antagonistic. I'm really trying to help you to, to wrestle through this text because we'll come to this text and we will just uh, kind of gloss over it uh, and not go deeper into what James is saying, and I, I hope we're going to get there. It may take a couple of lessons. Art. Back to what Nicole was saying. Talking about motives. We're, we're talking about motives. Right. We're looking at Abraham, Abraham here. Right. Who God revealed, who God, God uh, gave him revelation okay. to do something. And in obedience to that revelation, he went to Mount Moriah right. to, to sacrifice his son. Yes. His motive was his, his obedience to God. His motives was? His motives were to obey God when God told him what to do. Okay. That, that was his motivation. I want to please God. Um, and so I'm going to take my son in obedience to that. So motivation is, is a large part because 
other people sacrifice their children. Right. And what does what does that so so if you're making comparisons, you have people sacrificing their children. Here is Abraham. He's supposed to sacrifice his child. Well, what's the difference? What's the difference? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Or Abraham. Abraham, but see. Yeah. What do people see? Well, people saw Abraham. I don't know how many people saw Abraham. Maybe his his plan and people that were with him saw him go up to uh, Mount Moriah and said, "We're going to go sacrifice and we'll come back to you." And then you see other pagans mm. doing the same thing. Okay. So what was the difference? You say motive. I say the scripture says it was obedience. Obedience. Yes. Oh, yes, you can. Well, no, because I know that people have been, have, have tricked others. Okay. Maybe not intentionally, but. All right. All right. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Every single thing that we do in obedience yeah. can be done and look like obedience, but God knows the heart, and right. we know the heart, so we can't look at someone else and say, oh, because you're doing these things. No, you can. No, you can. You can, but what you're on the right track, though. You're on the right track. These actions, see, can certain actions be done for show? That's what you're saying. Yes. All of it can. Everything can be done by an unbeliever. Yeah. No, you all are making, you all are trying to make motivations the determining factor of faith, and that is not in the Word of God. Here in this text, here in this text, and in other texts, as we will see, the determining factor of whether you have faith or not is obedience to God. Obedience to God. Not motivation, obedience to God. Now let's look at some text together. Romans chapter 1, verse 5. Romans 1, verse 5. So I'm not arguing, and the scripture does not argue that motives are not important. Motives are important. But that's internal between you and God. The only thing people see, and the thing that proves that my motives are right, is what I do. Right? So I can say I have good intentions, but my issue is what did I do? My actions. Romans 1.5, Paul puts it this way, as he is giving his kind of um, letter or business card of his faith, he talks about, of course, uh, him being called and set apart for the gospel, verse 2, promised beforehand through the prophets and the holy scriptures, verse 3, concerning his son, born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh, verse 4, declared the son of God with power by resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, verse 5, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. The obedience of faith. He uses the same term in Romans chapter 16. Romans 16, verse 26. And this is what makes this issue such an issue of what, that we need to wrestle through because I don't disagree with what you all are saying from certain angles. Uh, Romans 16, verse 26, uh, beginning in verse 25, he says, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which has been kept secret for long ages past, verse 26, but now is manifested, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations leading to 
obedience of faith. Obedience of faith. Romans chapter 15, verse 18 Paul says, for I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles, I'm sorry, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and what? Word and deed. And so the only way that one can know that they are saved is by the evidence of one's life. The works of one's life. Not one's profession, not one's motivation, by the works of one's life. And this is why then James comes in James chapter 2, verse 22, and he says, you see, you see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was what? Verse 22, James 2, 22. Faith was, now does that mean that faith was missing something and then works supplemented what was missing? No, it does not mean that at all. What he is saying here is simply this, that Abraham's faith was brought to its goal. It was brought to its, its, its end as a result of his works. Faith is not meant to be that which is, just stays with you in and of itself. It is to be exercised. And not only that, he says, faith was not only made visible by the works, but he says those works were so that people could see its reality. Verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. In other words, what was, what was true about Abraham was brought to fruition. It's not that necessarily that he fulfilled a prophecy, it's just saying that what was true of him came to light. How did it come to light? Through his works. And then the end of verse 23 says this, and he was called a friend of God, a co-partner with the Holy One. It was a title of intimacy, a title of communion. It was the result of his obedience. He was not called a friend of God before Genesis 22, but after Genesis 22. Who are the friends of God? Jesus said it this way, John 15, 14. You are my friends if you do what I command you. How do you know a true Christian? You can tell by the pattern of their lives. The pattern of obedient works in their lives. That's how you can tell. And you're right, Kim. Some people can fool you for a long period of time, but if you wait long enough, you'll see where they're going to be later on. And if they will continue to obey God, and show themselves to be genuine. They can fool themselves, yes, and can fool many others. So here's the question that we must ask ourselves, does God call you friend? See, we can, we can make this all about somebody else, and, but what about you and me? Does God call you his friend? Am I a friend of God? Because I do what he says.
It's a, it's a sobering truth. But we cannot hide on the outskirts and just say, well, I come to church, I tithe, I'm nice to people, my motives are right. You know, I've been doing this for two years or five years or 10 years. We have to get past some of those superficial things and ask ourselves some real questions. Does the works of my life show that I have faith in God? Am I obeying the Lord? And is it showing in my life? You say, Pastor, that feels like a work salvation. All right, let's stop. I want to go f further, but I, my time is out. Right, Robert? I got to stop. <laughs> Next week, we'll consider Rahab but you can talk around this issue all you want to but if you come back to the scripture you're going to find this dynamic going on in your life between faith and works you're going to find that tension there and I understand the tendency to fight against a work salvation because we're saved by faith. But you, we cannot use that as a ticket and say, well, you know what? I, I, I have the ticket of faith. I'm good. No, we have to be able to say, wait a minute. If this ticket is a valid ticket, where does it show in my life? And I can't just say it because I come to church and pray and have quiet times and don't do people any wrong. There are lots of unbelievers who go to church who do good things. It has to be more than that to validate the ticket of being a true faith ticket. And as I have had to and as you, I hope, will search yourself you have to say, Lord, is there an obedience in my life? An obedience to your will in all things. Not just in the easy things. It's easy to come to church. It's easy to pay a tithe. It's easy to do certain things, to serve in a ministry. But, but are we willing to obey to the point of sacrificing self? Of denying self, taking up the cross, following him, no matter what. To the point where Abraham said, I will give you my dreams. I will give, I will give it all up if that means obeying you and trust in you. I will give. I've been waiting for this son my whole life. Every, my whole future is wrapped up in him. And if you ask me to give him up, I'll do it. I'll do it. You see, our obedience has to get down to the place where it, what does it cost you? Does it cost you anything? Father, I pray that as we think through the implications of your word, that you would guard us from stepping outside the boundaries of orthodox, sound theology, but that you would also help us not to be self-deceived. Help us, Lord. For there are many, Jesus said, 
Many who will say on that day, not some, but many. And we don't want to be in that number. Lord, we do ask, even in this moment, that you would search us and know our hearts, that you would try our anxious thoughts, that you would see if there would be any wicked way in us, if there is any wicked way in us. And then, Lord, we ask that you would lead us in the way of righteousness for thy name's sake. We know we can never earn your righteousness. You have given to it to us in Jesus perfectly. Oh, but if it has become ours, Father, by the power of your Spirit, help us to demonstrate it in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.